Well, it was 23 summers ago, and I was young and single and living in New York City, and I was working as a chaplain on the Upper Upper West Side at Columbia Hospital in New York. I had to be there all summer, and if you've ever been to New York in the summer, you know that it is extremely hot. It's all cement and stray dogs, and it is hardly any people, and most air conditioning units do not work. And so that's why the only thing I could do that summer to cool down was to go to a movie theater. Remember what those are? Okay, so I went to a movie theater, and that summer there was a movie, again, 23 years ago, 1998, was the movie Saving Private Ryan. Saving Private Ryan. An incredible movie with Tom Hanks, and it is a war movie, and if you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. But it's a movie about U.S. Army Rangers and the Battle of Normandy, and it is a battle about Omaha Beach, and it is a powerful depiction of young men, mostly, who stormed those cliffs at the Battle of Omaha Beach. But as I was sitting in that movie theater on that Friday afternoon by myself with a huge bowl of popcorn, two minutes before the movie began, an entire phalanx battalion platoon of army rangers marched into that movie theater. Now these men were in their 70s and their 80s because the Battle of Omaha Beach had happened over 50 years before that movie. But they still marched like they were a platoon who were marching in line. They got to their rows in the first two rows and they turned to the side, all of them, and they marched on in and they found their seat and they all sat down. It was a moment that I will never forget. But I'll be honest with you, the movie was great, but it wasn't the movie that day that I was watching. It was these US veterans of World War II. See, as the movie began, they were quite serious. They were quite stern. They were quite what the British might call stiff upper lip. But as those soldiers marched upon that beach on Omaha Beach, I began to see these old weathered faces begin to tear up with huge tears coming down their cheeks. And as I watched them, I wondered to myself, if perhaps these men had not cried about the war in over 54 years. I wondered to myself whether if these men had packed down those tears, had tamped them down, had forced them deep into their souls, and they hadn't allowed themselves to cry until this particular moment. <clears throat> and this is what I've been wondering lately, is if you and I aren't a little bit like these army rangers. You see, we haven't been through an exact war, but over this past year and some, we have been through a kind of war. We have been through a war of COVID, where today and Sunday, there will be even more. 547,020 Americans have died, and many more people of related sicknesses. We have been through a war of hate crimes and crimes against people of color, particularly and most painfully in the Bay Area, our Asian brothers and sisters. We have been through a war in our nation's capital, a war on January 6th. Men and women stormed the U.S. Capitol, laying victim to the police officers who protected that place. We are finding ourselves in the middle of a war where 16,000, not unaccompanied minors, no, 16,000 children are on our borders right now without their parents. And we are in the middle of a war in Boulder, where 10 people lost their lives this past week. And we are all in our own private little wars against depression and spiraling emotions and pent up frustrations. And here's what I'm wondering, is if like those US Army Rangers, if we haven't tamped down our tears too, that perhaps we haven't allowed ourselves to cry, to shed a tear over this entire previous year. And that what I'm wondering on this Palm Sunday is if this might be a great opportunity for us to do that thing, to cry, to shed a tear over these very tragic things that have happened. I don't know if you've followed the news this last week, but in the Suez Canal is a great 
tanker ship that carries 20,000 containers and has 200,000 tons of weight on it that is stuck in the Suez Canal. The ship is called the Ever Given. However, I wonder if today we might change the name to the Ever Stuck In. Yes, indeed. If you have a hard time ordering anything on Amazon this next week, it might be because your goods are stuck in the Suez Canal. But it isn't just the goods that are on that ship that are stuck. It's all the water behind it. It's the tens of thousands of millions of tons of water that have been backed up. And what I'm wondering is if this might be a good moment for us to let that water go in our lives, if that Suez Canal isn't a metaphor for our hearts. So here's my big idea for today. If you don't hear anything else in my message, remember this. I want to suggest that this coming week, this Holy Week, be a cry week. That this Holy Week, we will cry sometime this week. Now, as I said, I haven't cried for over a year. It's not that I don't want to. It's that there's a part of me that feels like I need to get through this thing before I can allow myself to shed a tear. And maybe you're, you're the same way. Interestingly, they have done studies on men and women, particularly in the United States, and they have found that women cry more often than men or feel permission to cry a German scientist found that women cry 30 to 64 times a year, where men only cry 6 to 17 times a year. You know, I always wonder, whenever they have these studies, how do they, like, how do they chart this? Do they give people like little pads and when they cry, they just like mark it down? Oh, 29. Okay. I don't know. And I don't even know if that's true. And it might be that people are not reporting the amount of times that they cry because they are embarrassed about it. I've seen this even in my own son's life. This is a picture of Ewan on St. Patrick's Day wearing a bit of plaid. But it's interesting, even though he is only four years old, my son Ewan, whenever he gets sad, he very rarely cries in public. He always marches off to his little closet, he slams the door, and he does his thing there. No matter how often I say to Ewan, Ewan, you could cry here, he cries in private. My prayer is that sometime this week, you might cry, either in private or in public, that Holy Week might be Cry Week. Now, you might ask yourself, <clears throat> Graham, why do we need to cry? What's the purpose of crying? What is the benefit of crying? I have three things for you today. The first is that crying goes deeper into our hearts. So I don't know if you're like me, but this last couple of months, I literally feel like my brain is not working. I don't know what's going on, but, but it's just not working the way I, it used to. And so I asked my friend, Dr. Tim Engelman, in jest this last week, if perhaps I could borrow his brain. Again, man, it is a joke. He said, sure thing. I'll send it to you tomorrow. And I'm like, ha ha. So the next day, the next day, Dr. Tim Engelman leaves this outside my door. Yes, it is his model of the human brain. Now, Tim explained to me, and he knew that we were preaching on the topic of crying today. And I'm going to ask our great cameraman, Michaela, to close up here. Tim explained to me that our thinking parts of our brain are our frontal lobes, this, this section here. That is why if you get into a car crash or something, it is the frontal lobe, it is the rational part of our brains that has a hard time. He also explained that it is our emotive side or our amygdala that is deep within the core of our being. It is deep within our brains. It is right next to our spinal cord here. So when we are crying, we are tapping into something deeper in our hearts. So that's the first thing. Crying goes deeper. The second point is sort of obvious. Crying gives us relief. It's sort of a pressure valve. Remember those old pressure cookers back in the day that had a valve in the top that let out the steam? God has given us a natural pressure valve in our lives. 
that we very rarely take advantage of. So when we cry, we are releasing emotions and sometimes anger. We are allowing sadness to come out. And if you want to put in the terms of my favorite singer, country singer, Dolly Parton, who said once, the more you cry, the less you pee. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to Dolly Parton. So number one, it goes deeper. Number two, it relieves something in our lives. But three, on this Palm Sunday, and this is the most important point today, the, the reason we should cry is because Jesus cried. Jesus cried. Jesus, the God of the universe, cried. Now, Jesus, we are told in the Bible, cried on two occasions. The first main occasion that we are told, again, Jesus probably cries more in his childhood. We'll get to that in a moment. But Jesus cried during the death of his best friend named Lazarus. It's the shortest verse in the entire Bible. If you're ever on Jeopardy or playing Trivial Pursuit, the shortest verse in the Bible is John 11:35. Jesus wept. Jesus cried. So we know that Jesus cried over Lazarus, incidentally, right before Lazarus' resurrection from the dead. The second time that we know that Jesus cries is in our text today. Jesus is entering Jerusalem, and he is on the way to the cross. He is also on the way to his own resurrection. And here we hear this incredible text about crying. Now, as we saw a couple weeks ago, Jesus was also a child, and surely Jesus cried during his childhood, as all children do. Which here's another little interesting point I learned this last week. Evolutionary biologists have learned, or have at least surmised, that the reason that children cry is because it is a kind of like GPS system for parents. It's like an alarm system. So when your kid cries, it lets the parent know where the kid is. It's happened for millions of years. Which, when my own kids cry, I'm like, okay, let's turn off the GPS system for a little bit. Okay, let's get into our text for today. Now, I want to read the entirety of this Palm Sunday text because, frankly, I want it to not just enter your rational thinking place, your frontal lobe. I want this text to enter something deeper into your amygdala, into that emotive part of your being. Luke 19, 28 through 41. Listen for the word of the Lord. After Jesus said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which nobody has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And he went along, and as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near to the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples, this would have been hundreds of people, began joyfully to praise God in a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. And they sang, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And they sang, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. By the way, the only time that Jesus had ever had that song sung over him before was when he was born and the angels themselves sang peace over the one who has come. But here's the focus for the morning. As Jesus approached Jerusalem and as he saw the city, he wept over it. He sobbed over Jerusalem. He cried deeply. Now, why did Jesus cry on that Palm Sunday? We will never really know because we aren't God. 
We know that Jesus was probably a little frustrated or angry or very upset with the religious establishment. We know that Jesus was no doubt sad about entering the Via Della Rosa as he was to walk to the cross. We know that Jesus had a panoply of emotions, that there were people who were happy around him and that people also cry when they are happy. Perhaps it is some swirl of this, but this is actually where when Jesus cries, it is different from the way that you and I cry. And here's the main, main, main thing I want you to hear today. When Jesus cries, Jesus' tears are always healing. They're always healing. They're tears that flow from the eyes of God down onto our lives, and they bathe us with God's healing in our lives. When Jesus cries, there is a deep bonding with us. When Jesus cries, there is a deep connection to our souls. When Jesus cries over us, there is deep sympathy with our hearts. When Jesus cries, there is deep affection for our beings. When, when Jesus cries, there is nurturing of our natures. When Jesus cries, there is deep healing of our hurts. And my friends, if our world needs anything right now, it is the tears of Jesus. It is the tears flowing down the face of God onto the city of Boulder, the tears of God flowing down the face of God, down onto our cities, onto our communities, onto COVID patients. It is those tears which we need so badly now. Now, it's a mystery why Jesus' tears are healing. But one of the things that's possible is that there is a mirroring that takes place. So when we cry, Jesus cries, and that when Jesus cries, it allows us to stop crying. This is actually a well-known psychological technique, mirroring. It's also a well-known parenting technique. When your kids are angry, you can get angry. When your kids are happy, you can be happy. And yes, when your kids are crying, you can sometimes mirror crying and that takes away the pain. I don't know if you've watched as many sort of dad memes as I have over this past year, but here's one that I saw that, that illustrates what I'm talking about. Here's a dad trying to mirror the tears of his daughter, and his daughter is not really crying, she's just sort of getting attention crying. When the dad mirrors her tears, notice that the girl's tears go away. Let's check this out. <laughs> My turn, my turn. Uh, okay, your turn. We're not crying anymore? All done? Is it my turn? Happy. Happy? Okay, good. You might give that a try, or you might just try the old technique of giving him a hug. But as I've thought about why Jesus' tears are healing for us, I've been thinking about this father who mirrors the tears of the child. And when we cry over whatever it is we cry, there is a moment when God says, okay, okay, okay. Now it's my turn. And God begins to cry. And it takes the pain out of our lives. So this next week, I want to encourage you to make Holy Week Cry Week. And to always remember that Jesus' tears are always healing. Thank you so much, God, for your power, for your might, but also for your heart, which cries for all of us. In Jesus' name we pray.